and we're just going to do a drive by of some of the agronomy experiments we have going on. And uh, where's Charles? Is he in the other one? Right oh, there he is. There, you've all met Charles. Um, I'm going to introduce my staff because I forgot to do that. So we have an actual rock star here. I don't know if you knew that. Ryan Dick. Now Ryan's a rock star in the true sense that he plays wicked drums, but what he doesn't realize is he's actually more of a rock star when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, because the, the amount of work and detail and time it takes to effectively do this at a technical level isn't something for everyone, but uh, he's excelled at that. The other thing you need to know about Ryan is that we grew up in the same farming community and I literally had to babysit him. <laughs> Which is weird, because he's older than me. <laughs> and now I babysit him. <laughs> yeah, right. He actually does, I think. So uh, you can see our wheat plots with a little bit of uh, applied moisture from a linear actually look a little bit better when Mother Nature doesn't cooperate. And so, one of the things we're doing with this trial here is back to tailoring systems for variety specific management is um, we, we, with Western Canada we've got some really really nice premium bread wheats coming along in terms of development with really high yield potential, short, strong, strong. So the question is man is how far can you push the management on them or what type of management do you need to actually optimize now that genetic potential which is increased. That through higher seeding rates perhaps you have to do that through different end management perhaps um, and so on and the other one that we the other issue we have with some of these high yielding CWS varieties is they do display that that uh, classic inverse relationship between yield and protein um, so some of them are yielding like crazy and still within that bread wheat class but not really getting the kind of protein that our grain buyers would prefer and so this study is looking into that um, but we're also looking into how well enhanced efficiency fertilizers play into that. So this study is strictly all banded fertilizer from super low rates all the way up to 240 kilograms of N <coughs> per hectare of actual. And, um, and with various ones. So we've got ESN in there, Super U, Agritain, some newer ones out of Europe, um, and so on. And then we have a second experiment related to this project that relates to you know, there's there's a, there's two schools of thought around split applications. One is like, why should I bother? And the other one is, why why would I ever put it all down at once? And so um, that one's going to try and tease out how 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 important or how how practical is it to split your end applications and achieve the results you want versus just banding it all, um, because we no longer. We don't have as much single shooting going on anymore, and so the idea that we're going to get end toxicity effects at planting probably isn't all that real. Um, so you can go ahead and pull up, Ken, if you can hear me. What variety do you have out here? This is AAC Viewfield, and we're looking at Brandon as well. Oh yeah, I'm going to. What should I say about that? <laughs> Sorry? So question is how many splits are we doing? We're going, we're comparing it all all to that's good right here, Ken. All to side banded versus one split versus two splits. Uh like thirty one and sixty I believe on the Zadox scale. Um, so really like, you know, early so that you optimize yield and then a little bit later so you can juice up the protein a little bit. That's the idea. Uh, yes, sir. Are you banding urea plus ESN as seeding as well? Yeah, we, uh, that's a good question. So we did a bunch of ESN work with winter wheat and one of the things that, uh, we were able to report, which was, which was, I think, good news for growers was that you can get exactly the same yield when side banding ESN if you bet if you do it at a ratio of one to one with uncoated urea versus 100% ESN so there's no need to go 100% ESN outside of the seed row as far as I'm concerned um, ESN pays for itself 
in buckets and in terms of uh, if you do have to single shoot because you can just about put all the end you need down with the seed and not have any issue uh, with that. Now this particular experiment, switching over to canola, this is the one you saw coming out of Death Valley. So you can see how it looks uh, when you have a little bit of irrigation. And uh, in fact, it looked better last year. So last year on dry land, we didn't get any rain after June and it looked better originally than this. Um, but just ran out of moisture and so it ended up yielding kind of what the southern Alberta average was for canola which was below 30 bushels an acre. Irrigated though with the same experiment we were, what were we, 90, 98 bushels with this. And so the reason we're, we, uh, we started up this experiment, there's a couple of innovations with canola recently. One is uh, the, shod, uh, the seed pod uh, reduction trait, shatter. Pod shatter reduction trade. I've been up since five and I'm jet lagged. Sorry. Um, so that's one innovation. And then the other one is like, okay, so how do I properly time or stage this stuff if I'm going to shift from a swathing operation to now where they want me to try straight cutting this stuff? And when should I straight cut? And how do I determine that within a canopy that could have all sorts of branching going on in relation to the seed density that we have? So this is, this is an early and a late hybrid under uh, three different sowing densities and uh, with four different harvest managements. Two related to early and late swathing and two related to early and late, as much as we can, late straight cutting. And then from that we're going to see how much we're losing in relation to that harvest management. Um, the other one that we're doing, because we're constantly trying to integrate winter wheat, is um, where are the Aussies? Are they all on this one or the other one or a mix? Some over there. So we've, we've done, well, we're going to, we're going to let you brag about two innovations today. One is, uh, we got an idea. I got an idea from Jim Halford who got an idea from Australia about starting your weed management at harvest management time with canola. And so we we're looking at onboard spring when you're swathing and how that helps and and what Jim's done at Indian Head is really really impressive from a weed management perspective when it comes to sequencing winter wheat in behind canola. So that whole onboard swathing and spraying operation is a pretty cool innovation and so we're trying to put some science around that to see how well it works here. The trouble we're having is we're not getting enough appropriate weed growth to really test the system. Two reasons, one we have very good weed management with our system but the other thing is it's tough to get those weeds to grow when you want them to. Um, yeah, they don't have the moisture, or especially trying to time it that way because you want the weeds coming up naturally like they would in a field, which is in crop. That's kind of tough to simulate uh, in the research world. So we're still trying to grow through that growing pain, as you, they would say. So you can fire it up, Ken, and keep rolling. Yeah. George. What possible, what products are you using with this uh, spray at harvest? Uh... What are we using on that one? That folder's in that van over there. I mean, the pre-plant that we're using is pyroxysulfone. Um, no. But we were spraying, were we not spraying down heat on that one too or something? I can't remember. We got so many new experiments going on, I'm just... Uh, You'll see a lot of them too today. So now we're entering some of the winter wheat work that we're doing and you'll see um, all of these, and Rob's already talked about this, but what we try and do with our agronomy experiments is showcase the latest variety that Rob's got and in this case this is wildfire. So every plot if it looks different is a function of uh, the management going on here. And yeah, this is good here, Kent. So you can see there's a little bit of variation in here. And so this one is a little bit about system intensity where we wanted to get our uh, friends that are in the disciplines of uh, weed management and pathology in here. And uh, we're looking at different, um, this is a pre-plant with pyroxysulfone compared to things like fall 2,4-D and uh, one or two shots of fungicide versus none. And, and so we're getting some nice differences, but this year is, an, the, the, the real discussion point about this one this year, these three plots here versus say, I guess these ones here, or some of these ones over here. Um, 
Anybody like to guess what the difference might be? Huh. That was all the same. So when I first looked at this and the guys were telling me about this, I was like, well, the stuff that's staying greener is the stuff that's had more fungicide put on it, dummies. And, uh, and that really isn't the case here, I don't think. But what we saw this year is well, out west here, we really don't see any phenoxy issues with putting fall 2,4-D down ever. Uh, but once in a while, what you'll get in a goofy year like this year is you'll get that system of, or that situation of head trapping where that plant's trying to outgrow itself. And so that, that uh, head gets trapped in that boot for a little bit before that oracle really releases and snaps it out. Typically, that's not a big deal. Um, some people think it is because it, it actually just looks worse than it is. And so what it's done is all the green stuff here, are those ones that had the head trapping in it, um, that's the biggest difference. There might be some fungicide stuff going on um, at a different level, but I think pr primarily what this year is, there's a difference between what the green is fall 2,4-D and the others either have the pyroxysulfone or, or a glyphosate type regular burn down on it. So, so you spray 2,4-D in fall? Yeah. And that's causing it to head, head, head emergence? It, it, it can, depending on the environment, but we've never seen it as an issue in terms of a yield limiting practice. In fact, what we've, what we've advocated and shown with our other winter wheat studies is really when it comes to winter wheat and its competitive ability, really the only thing you need is a fall 2,4-D application because there's no difference in yield compared to going either spring or a fall plus a spring application. You get aesthetic differences, so if you're really high on making sure everything looks weed free, go for it, but you're going to be losing money in terms of inputs because you spent money you didn't need it to. Um, down east, there's more concerns around phenoxy issues, but the big thing, the big lesson here is you, it has to be solely 2,4-D. You start playing around with MCPA and whatnot, and that's when you're going to see those issues related to real, real uh, injury. Uh, you know, it varies from you. We try to rely on natural infestations here, but you know, when it comes to winter wheat, it is such a good competitor. The only thing that'll take it down to a large degree is if you weren't managing your winter annuals all that great. And that's why fall 2,4-D is so effective because you do it in mid-October and it'll zing those ones to where they're not an issue. So does Ken know where to go? He knows, Ken? What's with the brown head going? Yes. Well, want me to come with you for a second or what? Find your side as well. So we initially thought that they, the plots that got additional shots of fungicide versus none was the thing that was giving it a bit of a stay green type thing, but uh, it's, it's more the fall 2,4-D, I think. Do you, do you have much problem with fox here, or is that not It's around. Like, Charles, we maybe want to... You may want to comment on that. Where did he go? Oh, pfft. what the hell are you doing back there? <laughs> I know you need the exercise, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> well, he's smart. He's going to walk to his vehicle. My van's about going to be two miles away by the time we're done. Question, what seeding rate are we using? We are using 450 seeds per square meter or 45 seeds per square foot. You would typically get about, um, I mean it varies quite a bit, but probably close to 340 to 350 at least. And that by the time spring rolls around would give you that optimum threshold we want to see of at least 25 or 250, better closer to 330 or 300. This would be the gravel road we didn't grade last night, apparently. For introduction, so we've got on the trailer back there our techie guy in our tech group, uh, Warren Taylor. So shout out to Warren. Um, and then uh, Adam Fast, one of our students. One of our little students, as you can tell. 
Yeah. Um, his dad actually has worked a long time in uh, Rob Graff's wheat breeding program. Um, Sherry, where are you? Or is she still here? So Sherry Hunt is, thank God, a uh, new hire for us, an admin assistant for me, and uh, that's been a lifesaver. And Alan Romini, are you, uh, which one are you in? Okay, so Alan is a new uh, research associate hired by us. There's a new project we won't be seeing today, but it relates to wheat yield gaps. Um, and she's going to be the research associate in charge of that project. So what you see on the right hand side here <clears throat> are some fusarium head blight trials that uh, are led by Dr. Kelly Turkington out of Lacombe. And one of the things we're looking at in this, because we know fusarium, that one of the best ways to manage fusarium is to as little as possible try to mitigate the ability of that fusarium to colonize and have those spores survive and reproduce. And one of the ways is through residue management. Um, and that can be a tough thing. So what we've done is we've stolen an idea from Australia and we're gonna try it here. And that's your Harrison Seed Destructor, which you needed for your, your herbicide resistant weeds. But we're gonna try it here to see if we can pulverize residue enough with that type of a system behind a combine to see if that helps mitigate spores because producers obviously have a tough choice to make they can turn down the fan and reduce the amount of inoculant they're putting back on their fusarium infested fields or they can crank the fan up and kick all that back into the field so they don't aren't delivering it to the elevator for grain reducing uh downgrading factors and so so if you were to turn uh the fan up and we're running it through that seed destructor before it went down is that going to help in terms of not allowing that fusarium to um, to colonize as well as it would want to. So we're kind of a check control here because we don't get that much fusarium. Um, uh, but uh, we're gonna be looking at it in both the barley, we've got barley up there, wheat here, and then another experiment on the other side. So quite a bit going on, on that, in that respect. Um, what else was I gonna say about that? I think that's it. That's good, I think we can drive, drive around. loop around. Can you loop around, Ken? Like up through the okay, so. <laughs> Um, so I was asked if we seeded our barley really, or any seed really deep, would that help in the way of mitigating um, the ability of fusarium to colonize it? And uh, I'm not sure, to be honest, but I think, I think the problems you'd run into by seeding deep from an agronomic yield perspective would probably outweigh any advantage you'd have. I think if you were just treating your seed, that would help a lot. Um, so that's my two cents worth. Um, so back to winter wheat and trying to integrate it. Um, we've really solved a lot of problems around winter wheat in terms of, I think Rob's doing a great job of catching it up on the quality side. I don't think there's as much of an argument anymore about how much more and better quality you have with some of the spring classes like CPS. And I think it's going to get even better on that side. So, but we still come down to the problem of how do we integrate this winter growth habit into a spring system that's dominated by spring annuals. And, and so we've got an issue with winter wheat or with canola because really the real yield advantage we're seeing with the newer hybrids is basically coming by extending growing degree day requirements on it. And that's making it more and more difficult. And I think the move towards straight cutting canola isn't going to help that a whole lot. Um, so we're working on that in terms of some of the studies that we're gonna be doing here. This one is, um, is it, what would you really follow up in terms of a preceding crop? Like what, what would be the best crop to crop behind when it comes to winter wheat? And that's what this study is all about. So these, these wheat variety, these wheat, uh, this is wildfire again. And, and so basically what we've done is we've planted this into a range of preceding crops or break crops like the Australians like to call it. And this is really where I got the idea from. There was a nice paper out of Australia, I believe, where they looked at I think 600 different types of, of, of experiments or data points. And um, basically what they came up with was in terms of the best response you'll get from, winter, from wheat when it comes to planting into a break crop would be um, number one pulses, um, followed by oil seeds, followed by planting onto a cereal stubble. So would we observe the same here and so we're we're planting into a range of crops that we'll see when we pull out of here ranging from faba beans all the way to just straight oats and how that works 
And then what we're doing to measure that is we're going to be planting either winter wheat or spring wheat right after it, and then following it up again with wheat again, either spring wheat or winter wheat. So we'll have winter wheat, spring wheat, spring wheat, winter wheat, or spring wheat, spring wheat, or winter wheat, winter wheat, just to see if there is a response. Is it persistent through a second phase of that? So that's that. So, Claire. Yeah, and so there's so there's the practical thing, and yeah, right. So what we've seen from from a residue perspective is that uh, the studies we've shown today is that you don't need canola. Your uh, your pea stubble and your barley silage stubble gives you the same yields of winter wheat that canola stubble would. Um, the question here is what would happen if you do we, will we also see the same result where wheat is going to respond best when it follows up pulses? How many would agree with that? Yeah, yeah so what I think we'll see, but I think what we've found so far with our rotational studies is that you actually get a yield drag when you pull canola out. Um, and so I would argue that probably canola may be more important for us. Uh, but we'll see from the data when we're done. All these are real new trials, so we don't we don't have all the answers yet. Um, yeah, because we don't want to. We don't want it. The question is, would you adjust your end rates and whatnot based on what the pre and that's what we're doing. We're getting Eric actually is giving us the his recommendations from the PRS system, and we're going with that. So if we have any screw ups there, it's Eric's fault. <laughs> this is all under irrigation, right? Yeah, at this site, but this is growing all over Western Canada. Yeah, but of course, when the water gets closer, like the difference is the whole thing about the water out there is going to feed this. So the rest of that layer is then to be going to feed the canola. Yeah, except the study I referred to was had was dry land. Yeah. So then we would have seen peas do better than it did. Sure. The reason canola is doing better is probably around the whole mycorrhizal fungi thing where it's fumigating and some people think you don't need that and others think you do and our data seems to support that it doesn't hurt to have a phase that isn't a host for that and wipes it out a bit and wheat seems to respond to it so we better get rolling Ken on to the next site before the questions get too difficult the rotation yeah that's the last stop for us then we're going to take a look at quick look at something that Charles has. <laughs> so I'll try to I'll try to remember to repeat the questions with the two trailers. I got criticized for that, but the truth is I only repeat them when I know the answer. So um, Gary stumped me, so I didn't repeat it. Uh, so two projects right here. One is uh, behind you. One thing we talked a little bit earlier about the whole G by E by M thing. And so this is kind of a neat focus study of the spring wheat we drove through. That is a nitrogen use efficiency study where we're looking at populations of Dr. Dean Spanner's program up at the University of Alberta, where we were collaborating on a project where we're trying to see how much differential there is in terms of uh, responses to both super low end situations and in situations where we're really jacking up the end rates. And so you've got a zero or an almost zero end or whatever, just the background residual is versus I think we're at about two, 240, I think. Warren, how much nitrogen did we put on that? Oh, you don't know the answer. Lots. Lots, okay. So the question is how much how much differential is there in terms of uh, genetic variation when it comes to nutrient use efficiency within um, at least our populations that we had out here? I mean, I know John Kirkgaard was involved in a pretty cool study where you guys were looking at that in terms of... Uh, uh, a different type of response. I think that one was drought tolerance where you found nice variations in gen of genetic variation in terms of coleoptile length or something like that, wasn't it? And, and so, there, so there's, there's probably variation out there. I don't know how strong it is. I'm, I, I wonder, um, but that's something that's becoming increasingly of interest, obviously. Um, and then behind here, uh, we always get this thing about how, you know, winter wheat doesn't pay as much or doesn't yield as much to conventional rotation. So this is going to serve as kind of a neat study where we're 
It's basically a bunch of three-year rotations behind me, canola, wheat, pea, and we're, for the wheat phase, we're, we're comparing our winter wheat, which was right, right by us in the front trailer here, this uh, wildfire. Rob Graff was bragging to me about his wildfire plots over there, and then I said, well, have you been to Fairfield yet? Because mine are six inches taller. He's like, how much water did you put on there? I'm like, <laughs> that's the M, buddy, the M. And so we're comparing our, what I think is probably one of our best varieties within that to the different classes of spring wheat. Um, so we've got, um, uh, I think it's, what is it, CNHR back there, Penhold or CPS, and then we've regular CWRS, Viewfield, um, Faller. Faller as our... Um, as our general purpose. And at the end there, um, we're, we're looking at a very relatively early maturing uh, uh, Durham variety because one thing we're going to work with Curtis Posniak out of Saskatchewan on is, is pushing Durham out of its traditional zone of adaptation. And that requires an earlier variety. And right now, um, there's not a lot of interest in those earlier varieties because he couldn't even unload the breeder seed he had of that variety. Um, but we're hoping, we're hoping it's something we can prove because we'll grow spring wheat anywhere of the other classes, but we, we're very reluctant to do it with Durham and we're going to challenge that mindset with this study as well. We haven't had varieties this early before, ever. And in fact, I would argue that a lot of the a lot of the uh, Durham varieties don't differ a whole lot in terms of maturity. And this one was kind of a unique one out of Curtis's pro program. But yeah, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of interest in it. So we're going to see how well it works in non-traditional zones like Lacombe and further north to see just how detrimental it is. Um, so with that, I think we'll get rolling and then we're going to stop by. Do you guys know where to stop for Charles' stuff? Right? No. Hey, um, Do you know where to go? Where the buses are, it's like the first experiment when you drive in. Yeah, so the question is, are you are you optimizing the phase of the system? And that's what we're trying to do is fully optimize each system so that, you know, all you, you set up winter wheat for failure by treating it the same as a spring wheat or vice versa. So in this case, it's like we're we're pushing it as much as we can to see what kind of responses we get from it. And and we'll see what happens. We're also going to, I think, be doing some carbon measurements out of there, see what kind of sustainability metrics we can pull out of this as well. So there's that Durham variety right there, that earlier one. I forget, I think it's CDC Desire. So young Charles, I'll turn it over to you. Unless you have to, well, you'll probably have to yell out directions with this one anyway. Okay, we just have a few linear tracks to go over here, but uh, so yeah, again, I'm, I'm the weed scientist here. Um, I work, my program works fairly closely with Brian's program as well. Um, so we toured a bunch of Brian's experiments. We have uh, four experiments over on this next strip beside us here. Um, some of them we, we won't be able to make it to today just because the linear irrigation is right on our road to get there. Um, but we're going to stop at the front there and talk about um, one of the new rotation experiments that we're starting up here. Um, most, actually, this this is a, an interesting experiment. This is the soil quality experiment um, established 30 years ago, where they scalped out the whole A horizon of that field and deposited uh, 36 different soils and plots. And it was initially irrigated wheat, actually, right here. And there's another yeah. dryland site around. And they were basically looking at what what defines a quality soil for the semi-arid prairies. Um, so it's since been seeded back to perennial grasses now. Um, but anyway, so these experiments beside us here, this one over here is looking um, similar to the preceding crops that Brian was talking about before wheat. Um, we're also doing that before soybean. Um, so soybean is a... It's kind of a newer crop for this area. Um, as, as shorter and shorter season varieties of soybean are released, um, it starts moving its way 
westward. And I'm actually originally from Manitoba, and I did my PhD on soybean production. Um, but for that experiment, we're looking at uh, we're looking at preceding crops, either wheat, canola, um, soybean, or corn, um, and basically creating stubble this year. And then next year, we're going to come in and seed soybean across the experiment under either conventional tillage, which would be a tandem disc, or um, seeding zero tillage. The idea is that um, the preceding crop stubble will tie up certain nutrients, um, making them less available. But also, um, we're looking at the speed at which soybean established in the spring under weedy and weed-free conditions. So the idea is that we're trying to take a systems approach to develop um, a soybean to develop a soybean management uh, program to help the crop basically be as competitive as possible and try and mitigate um, the spread of basically glyphosate resistant weeds. Because soybean, most of the soybean grown on the prairies is glyphosate resistant. So this experiment right beside us here is another new rotation that we have starting up. And uh, it's looking at a, uh, a wide range of sort of what we would call diverse crops or minor crops. It's funded under the integrated or under the uh, diverse field crop cluster. And basically we have uh, most, most of them are actually at that other end, but uh, kind of tillage is up. yeah, we have a lot of gophers and moles <laughs> and everything. Um, anyway, so this experiment is looking at um, right now we're in mostly the oilseed phase. So we have flax, we have canola, we have um, industrial mustard, Nebraska carinata. We also have yellow mustard, oriental mustard, um, and multiple other things. Farther at that end, we get even more diverse where we're looking at canary seeds, sunflowers, um, as well as some other mustards. And the idea is with this rotation, this is the first year, so this is our kind of diverse crop year. Next year we'll go into the pulse phase where we're either seeding them to, um, to field pea or lentil. And basically this experiment is looking at how can we fit these diverse crops into crop rotations. Um, so we're looking at mostly the legacy effects that, that many of these mustard crops have and what that will do to nodulation and rooting of the pulses next year, um, but also down the road. So we're doing a wide range of measurements uh, focusing on agronomy, but we're also doing looking at weed management implications because many of these crops um, don't have the best herbicide management uh, program available. We don't have enough uh, registered herbicides for these crops. Um, in addition to that, we're also looking at soil health concerns and we're looking at uh, soil moisture over the course of the rotation as well. Any questions on that? That's a very brief overview, but I think we're kind of out of time here. So. Any questions? Good. Well, now you know why we hired this guy. He's going to be a rock star in his own world. So, uh, thanks. I think, I think that's it for us. We've hit. We are, we're actually on time. I think too. Four thirty. We're on time. Um, so thanks. Thanks for your time coming out and your attention. And uh, uh, hopefully, we'll see you out here another time. <laughs>